Tonight, Russia intensifying attacks on Ukrainian cities. The shocking moment, a missile hit a bus in Kyiv. An apartment building there also struck. Firefighters rushing to rescue residents trapped inside. Peace talks ending again with no resolution as Russia moves closer to NATO member Poland. And tonight, the warning from the U.S. to China over the conflict. Nearly three million people have now fled the violence, but the journey out is long and dangerous. Tonight, our Ali Aruzi speaks to a 17-year-old who left his parents to escape with his grandmother, but their quest for safety instead ended in tragedy. Back here at home, the urgent manhunts in New York City. Police searching for a man they believe is behind a string of shootings targeting homeless people. And he may be tied to several crimes in Washington, D.C. as well. Plus, the man wanted for stabbing two employees inside New York City's famed Museum of Modern Art. Gas prices soaring, surveillance video showing the driver accused of siphoning nearly a thousand gallons of fuel from a gas station in Houston, Texas. Gas prices in the U.S. up nearly 30 cents from a week ago. Will Americans see any relief at the pump? Royal absence. Queen Elizabeth missing the annual Commonwealth Day service and asking her son Prince Charles to stand in. And is a family rift widening? Prince Harry announcing he will miss a memorial service for his grandfather, Prince Philip, on the one-year anniversary of his death. Also, Tom Brady returns the superstar quarterback coming out of retirement after just 40 days. What it could mean for the league. Top Story starts right now. Good evening, I'm Kate Snow in for Tom Yamas tonight. We begin another week on Top Story with the war in Ukraine. Peace talks again ending with no resolution as attacks escalate in civilian areas. A series of airstrikes hitting the capital city of Kyiv today. Residents rushed out of a burning apartment building and drone footage now showing massive destruction in the southern city of Mariupol where a convoy of humanitarian aid is desperately trying to reach those unable to leave. The number of people trying to leave the war zone is staggering now. More than 2.8 million have fled the violence, with more European countries now seeing an influx of Ukrainians. Ukraine's President Zelensky will address U.S. lawmakers virtually this week after Congress passed a bill that would provide nearly $14 billion in aid to Ukraine. And late today, the White House warning China of, quote, significant consequences if Beijing provides Moscow with economic or military support. Let's get right to Richard Engel in Ukraine once again tonight. Beware of Russia on its back foot. Apparently frustrated by its lack of progress on the battlefield, Russia is laying waste to Ukrainian cities and civilians from afar. Ukraine says this is an incoming Russian missile intercepted by Ukrainian air defenses falling and exploding on the streets of Kyiv. Nearby, Russia destroyed an apartment building the strike just after 5 a.m., when most people were sleeping. There are no military targets here. This is just a civilian apartment building surrounded by other apartment buildings. And the only possible reason for attacking it is to kill civilians and terrorize the population just a few miles from the center of Kyiv. Serhi says intuition must have woken him. He was having a smoke when suddenly, in the slow time of extreme fear, he saw a flash and then the windows and doors came crashing in. Nina, a downstairs neighbor, was shaken but unhurt. In the aftermath, she was happy not to be alone. Do you have a mother, she asked. Her name happens to be Nina, too. Nina's three-room apartment is devastated. She was in bed asleep. And all of this fell on top of you? Uh -huh. But you, it's amazing you're not hurt. Mm. Not even in a little broken glass, nothing. I had a big blanket on top of me, so all good, she says. Adding, she feels pity for Putin's mother, who is turning in her grave that she gave birth to such a nasty bastard. Outside lay the body of a man killed for being in his home. But even here, the spirit of resistance is unbroken. Meanwhile, Russia is taking its war further west, striking a military training base near the Polish border. While in the east, hitting Ukrainian homes in Kharkiv, Volnovaha, and Mariupol, where a humanitarian corridor today finally pierced the blockade, allowing hundreds of packed cars to leave. 
but too late for this pregnant woman in an iconic image after the bombing of a maternity hospital. She died. According to the Associated Press, when she was told her baby was dying, she said, kill me now. Attempts to save her were unsuccessful. Kate, for the fourth time, Ukrainian and Russian delegations met for peace talks. This time it was virtual, but for the first time, the two sides agreed to temporarily pause, that was the phrase they used, the talks, and then continue them tomorrow. And both sides are hinting, just hinting, at possible progress. Kate? All right, Richard, thank you. Stay safe there. As the war continues to rage on, more than two and a half million Ukrainians have now left the country, made their way to safety. Hungary alone has taken in more than 200,000 refugees, and that number continues to increase. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is there with more. Tonight, the war's refugee crisis, which the U.N. calls the largest since World War II, is expanding throughout more of Europe. Hungary has already seen more than 250,000 refugees, second only to Poland. Today, Margarita Prosolovich told us a bombing leveled her home. She and her 13-year-old son, Nikita, now have only the clothes on their backs. It's just impossible to imagine, she says. This is the growing refugee crisis. This train station in Budapest sees thousands of refugees each day. Many of them spend hours here before boarding trains to other parts of Europe. Other countries such as Slovakia, Moldova and Romania are also seeing an influx. Now stoic are the faces of women and children, burdened with uncertainty, hardened by catastrophe. This man told us because of his age and a disability, he was one of the few men allowed to leave Ukraine. How horrible is it to have to leave your homeland behind? Um, well, it's, it's like, you know, you, you, you have a feeling of death behind you. Alex Vaga is a Hungarian volunteer handing out supplies. He's just 15 years old. And I have a friend whose whole family is dead. No one deserves this. I really don't like it. I'm trying my best to help, but I'm just a 50-year-old kid. I can't really do much. We also found a group of international college students, many of them Nigerian, who attended Sunni State University in northeastern Ukraine. I wake up every day confused and I... Sometimes I don't even really want to wake up. I just want to keep sleeping because when I wake up, I think about my problems and they are so overwhelming. They showed us pictures of their harrowing escape, fighting their way through a crowded train station after spending two nights in a bunker, terrified of the shelling outside. I wouldn't even pray for my enemy to go through, go through that because, I mean, like, we couldn't sleep. It's like you're sleeping with one eye open. A U.S.-based charity, Global Empowerment Mission, is taking donations to rent these students Airbnbs in Hungary. A refuge, if only temporary, for the innocent caught in war. And Gabe joins us now from Budapest. Gabe, how many total refugees are we talking about now? Well, Kate, the U.N. says that already more than two and a half million refugees have already left Ukraine. And those students, like so many other refugees we spoke with, don't know when or if they'll be able to return to the country. They're just taking it one day at a time as they make their way west. Kate. Gabe, thank you so much. The trip for refugees is a dangerous one, fraught with hardship. NBC's Ali Aruzi is in Lviv, where one family has met with conditions far worse than they ever could have expected. And it, he has their heart-wrenching journey. On the other side. 17-year-old Vlad and his grandmother Lubov's passage to safety turned into a desperate scramble to save her life. Their perilous, long journey took them from the battered east to the relative safety of the west, but it didn't go as planned. The strain of it all became too much. Lubov, worried for her pet cat, collapsed just after arriving in Lviv by bus. When uh, we went out from the bus, she became bad, uh, so she has some problems with heart. Uh, and uh, I went to the medical center uh, and asked for the help. An overwhelmed Vlad found that help for his grandmother from the Samaritan's Purse, an American charity with a health clinic helping the displaced at the train station in Lviv. So we ran over there, literally, and um, started administering aid. Uh, she had a pulse when she got there. She was, uh, she was weak, uh, sweaty. No time for a stretcher. A nurse named Peter lifted her on his back and ran to the medical tent. 
It's not perfect, but when you're in a crisis, uh, you do what you have to do. Vlad was already emotional. He had to leave his parents behind. I am really nervous. Uh, I hope that all will be okay. Uh, and I think that I did everything what I can to help my uh, grandmother. He told us his grandmother's name, Lubov, means love in Ukrainian. She wants to stay at home, but it is very dangerous to uh, last at the Sumi because every day their attacks are more, uh, are bigger and bigger. We will stay here. My grandmother don't want because she think that uh, in other countries she can't uh, live uh, because she loves Ukraine. The medics stabilized her. Where's the cat? The cat's here. Yeah, yeah. She was taken into a waiting ambulance, but it didn't drive off. From outside, we could see the vehicle bouncing up and down. The medics were working desperately on her, but again, her vitals dropped. This time, nothing could be done. She couldn't be saved. <laughs> I, I can see. Vlad broke down. The bombs and bullets may not have killed his grandmother, but the stress of war did. What, what, what's next for you, Vlad? What are you going to do now? I don't know. I called my mother. She will come here. Lviv was meant to be a safe place for Vlad and his grandmother. The tragedy etched on his face. He clutched onto her few belongings and her cat, devastated at the loss, the future uncertain. It's just absolutely devastating. Ali Aruzi joins me now from Lviv. Ali, where are Vlad and his family now? Well, Vlad's mother traveled back from Sumi to pick up her mother's body and take it back to be buried. Vlad's next move is uncertain. We got in touch with Vlad's mother and asked her if we could interview her. She sent us a message back saying she's too emotionally exhausted to talk to us and that the war has taken away her dearest person. And that's part of the tragedy here, Kate, that when people say goodbye to their loved ones, they don't know if it's going to be the last time. In the U.S. tonight, we're learning that the president could be switching up his diplomacy plan on the war in Ukraine and is in early discussions about traveling to Europe. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell joins me now from the White House. So, Kelly, what is the White House considering? Well, good evening, Kate. There are several officials who tell us that discussions are underway for a possible trip to Europe in the coming weeks for President Biden. This would be a chance for him to show solidarity with European allies and, of course, the NATO countries that are doing a couple of important things. They've been working with the United States to impose those financial penalties on Russia. And we know in the eastern flank of NATO, there are also real concerns about the refugee flow and the vulnerabilities they may face with Putin's aggression. So if the president chooses to go, he could demonstrate that solidarity and he could deliver a powerful message. At this point, the White House is not saying that a trip is on. It's under consideration. Kate? And Kelly, in addition to that, we learned that Ukraine's president may address the U.S. Congress. What do you know about that? Well, this would be a virtual address that would be pumped into the U.S. Congress and by extension, then the American people could see it as well. And we've seen how uh, President Zelensky has been using his way to communicate around the world as a persuasive tool to try to talk about the things that he needs in this fight. And we also know that he is continuing to say he wants a no-fly zone, something the U.S. does not support. And he wants fighter jets, something that some lawmakers do support, but the White House has not not been supportive of. Instead, the Biden White House wants to send and is continuing to send other kinds of defensive weapons to Ukraine. It's also a chance for President Zelensky to make his personal appeal to American lawmakers, to thank them for the support they've been giving, and to reach out personally. So that'll be something everyone will watch very closely this Wednesday. Kate? All right, Kelly O'Donnell at the White House Force. Kelly, thank you. With Russia escalating its attacks across Ukraine, we want to bring in Colonel Matt Dimmick. He's the former director for Russia and Eastern Europe at the National Security Council. Colonel, nice to have you with us. Uh, let's start with what happened over the weekend, that strike near the Polish border at a military base. It raised a lot of concerns. If there's an accidental strike on Polish territory, NATO could officially invoke Article 5 for collective defense. Do you think NATO countries need to be prepared for that possibility? What should the response be? 
Absolutely. That needs to be a primary concern of uh, all the NATO nations that are on Ukraine's border. And those strikes on Yavri, they just show uh, how close Russia is willing to go. They're going to be willing to come right up to the line of uh, NATO's Article 5. So uh, NATO has, has got to be prepared for it, and we uh, just have to be uh, ready for any kind of accident or incident. Now, taking a step back, we I don't think anybody is concerned that uh, you know Russia is uh, about to take on the NATO alliance at this point in time while they're struggling to make uh, uh, any sense of their campaign in Ukraine. So I think uh, any kind of incident that's going to happen, I think the initial uh, conclusion should be that it was probably an accident or a straight plane that crossed the border. And NATO needs to keep its head about, uh, you know, NATO leaders need to keep their wits about them and make sure that uh, they understand exactly what's happening if there is an incident and take the appropriate measures without overreacting or reflexively uh, implementing some kind of Article uh, 5 response mm -hmm. unnecessarily. Let me ask about uh, Russia and China. U.S. officials have said mm -hmm. that Russia asked China for military equipment and support. China's pushing back on that report. But does it concern mm -hmm. you that there might be an agreement going on between Russia and China? I have my doubts. I know that uh, uh, Russia and China uh, famously not long ago said they have a uh, friendship without limits. But I think that uh, China is introducing Russia to exactly what some of those limits might be. China's been trying to walk a very fine line here. They didn't sign up for a, a long, protracted uh, and blundering invasion of Ukraine and all of the things that come with being yoked to uh, Russians, uh, you know, Russia's invasion there. So they want to be uh, seen as uh, still supporting Russia, but without all the baggage that comes with it, so that they aren't in invoking the wrath of this anti-Russia global coalition that could exact some serious penalties on China's economy if China is perceived as being too supportive of Russia's war aim. So I don't expect uh, China to be uh, shipping any arms or equipment to Russia anytime soon or making any moves in that direction. The White House, the Pentagon have said repeatedly they will not institute a no-fly zone. Some military experts now are calling for a limited no-fly zone, which, as I understand it, would essentially protect humanitarian aid and evacuations. Do you, do you think that's a good idea, or does that carry the same risk of escalating things? I don't think it's a good idea at all. I think uh, you know, there's some serious people with some serious recommendations about how to implement a no-fly zone and how to do it. And obviously, the reasons are compelling. It's a a, you know, morally clear position to take, and it's a satisfying position to take. But I think all the advocates for a no-fly zone uh, have uh, failed to make the argument clear on exactly how preventing Russian fixed-wing and rotary-wing aircraft from uh, existing in Ukrainians, uh, Ukraine's sky uh, is worth the commensurate unlimited risk of uh, invoking a conflict between NATO and Russia. Uh, you know, the, the vast majority of civilian casualties, we think, are being produced by uh, rockets, artillery, uh, and just ground fire, uh, which a no-fly zone would have no impact. Uh, and none of the advocates for no-fly zone have been able to explain how we exactly uh, we're going to ask the Russians not to test that airspace and expect them to sit idly by. The, there will obviously, uh, Russians are going to test that with their aircraft. And they also are you know, the advocates for no-fly zone don't have an answer on what do we do about the scores of sophisticated Russian anti-aircraft equipment that certainly aren't going to sit idly by on Russian territory that uh, no-fly zone aircraft would have to deal with. Colonel Matt Dimmick, interesting to talk to you always. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. While this war is being fought on many different fronts, a propaganda battle is also underway. Russia now accused of spreading disinformation that is now being picked up here in the U.S. NBC's Jacob Ward has that story. There was a network consisting of at least 30 biological laboratories. At the U.N., Russia's ambassador pushed a conspiracy theory Friday, saying at least 30 research labs in Ukraine are actually U.S.-backed bioweapons facilities, conducting what he calls dangerous experiments. U.S. officials vehemently deny the accusations. I will say this once. Ukraine does not have a biological weapons program. And they warn Russia could be trying to justify its invasion. This influence campaign is completely consistent with longstanding Russian efforts to accuse the United States of sponsoring bio uh, weapons. This is um, a classic move by the Russians. While Russia is amplifying this conspiracy theory now, it appears to have begun on far-right social networks in the U.S. back in February, 10 days before the invasion. And now it's gone viral in America. Far-right voices online, cable news, and public figures who are rewarded with millions of views. Facebook, Twitter, and others have banned Russian state media and its coverage of this narrative. Because they trend online, it means that mainstream media hosts or social media influencers 
are incentivized to essentially pick up on those narratives and amplify them because it brings more eyeballs to their content, more clicks on their platforms, and ultimately can be more dollars in their pocket. How can we solve this problem? Some of the solutions are going to involve holding the actors with disproportionate power in this conversation responsible. With independent and Western journalism shut down in Russia, citizens there are being regularly misinformed. But misinformation is finding an audience here in the wide open West as well. Jake Ward, NBC News. Still ahead tonight, the multi-state manhunt, a suspect wanted for a string of deadly shootings targeting homeless people, and now he's being attacked, being linked to attacks in New York City and Washington, D.C. Plus, the stabbing caught on camera inside the Museum of Modern Art in New York, what we're learning about the suspect and his ties to that museum. And Queen Elizabeth missing Commonwealth celebrations today, but it's the absence of another royal stirring up some questions tonight. Stay with us. We're back now with the manhunt for a suspect wanted for a string of shootings targeting homeless people. The crime spanning across at least two cities. Our Emily Aketa has the chilling details. Tonight, investigators releasing new images of the gunman behind five senseless shootings. Authorities in both New York and Washington, D.C., urging homeless people to be vigilant. Homelessness should not be a homicide. This was a cold-blooded attack. The attacker most recently caught on camera in Manhattan, walking up to a sleeping man Saturday and firing execution style. Earlier that morning, police say the suspect shot another person less than a mile away. Investigators believe he could be the same gunman wanted in three other incidents in Washington, D.C. earlier this month. So far, shooting five homeless people, killing two. Leave these people alone, like they're going through their own struggles and it's unfortunate that they're in the situation that they are. The attacks playing out amid a homelessness crisis that housing officials say was worsened by the pandemic. Several weeks ago, New York leaders began enforcing a zero tolerance policy for people sleeping on the subway, a move aimed at cutting back on crime in the nation's most robust public transit system, up more than 70 percent from this time last year. But critics say there aren't enough accessible housing options in the city, so pushing homeless people out of the subway is pushing them into even more vulnerable situations. A society that meets people's basic needs and starting with housing and including mental health care for people who need it will be a safer society. Cities searching for solutions as the threat against the homeless grows more imminent. And Emily Aketa joins us now from here in 30 Rock. So do they suspect that there might be even more victims than we already know about? Okay, unfortunately, there is still the possibility that there could be more victims. When you consider the fact that one of the homeless men wasn't found by police until, until nearly 12 hours after he was shot here in New York. Also, we talked about that band of investigating agencies. They are now putting out a call to the public to really come forward with any information anyone might have on this suspect, and they're offering a reward in the tens of thousands of dollars, Kate. All right, Emily, thank you. Police in New York City are also searching for the suspect who stabbed two people inside the Museum of Modern Art. Surveillance video captured the man jumping over the museum's front desk before repeatedly stabbing two people. One person threw items toward the attacker, allowing those employees to get away. Both 24-year-old victims are expected to survive. Police have identified the suspect as Gary Cabana, who they say recently had his museum membership revoked. Overseas now to London, a big day at Westminster Abbey, though marked by a noticeable absence. The annual Commonwealth celebrations bring out nearly every member of the royal family, but not this year. Kathy Park has more. Queen Elizabeth's highly anticipated return to the public stage is still on hold for now, following her COVID recovery. She missed today's Commonwealth Day service, her 70th, a crowning achievement for the monarch. Instead, asking her son, Prince Charles, to stand in, with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge in attendance as well. The Queen still releasing her annual message, affectionately calling the Commonwealth a group of 54 current and former British colonies, the family of nations. Adding, she hopes that in these testing times, the countries can draw strength and inspiration from what they share, and quote, work together towards a healthy, sustainable, and prosperous future for all. The last service was two years ago, before the pandemic, and when Prince Harry and Meghan Markle made their final appearance as senior royals. You could see the sort of uh, friction between 
the royal couples and the rest of the royal family um, rather than about the Commonwealth. So I think the Queen will be very keen that this year's service is focused on what the Commonwealth is all about, which is unity. And while the palace didn't say why the Queen would be absent, officials did say she will continue with other planned engagements, including in-person audiences in the week ahead. The next royal gathering is set for the end of the month, a memorial service for the Queen's late husband, Prince Philip. But drawing some backlash, Prince Harry, who won't be there. He is attending the Invictus Games in April. His spokesperson said he hopes to visit his grandmother as soon as possible. The Queen's health has been in the spotlight after her hospitalization last October and her COVID diagnosis in February when she experienced mild cold-like symptoms. After canceling some online meetings during her recovery, she was back to work last week, hosting virtual engagements and welcoming Canada's Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau to Windsor Castle, showing the world she's on the mend. At 95, the Queen is Britain's longest reigning monarch and also happens to be her platinum jubilee year. So that means in June, the stage will be set for a four day long celebration marking her 70 years of service, a historic milestone. Kate? Okay, Kathy Park in London, thank you. Still ahead tonight, officers struck. The body camera footage showing a driver hitting officers while he was trying to flee. What happened moments before the violence scene? Plus, the massive cargo ship stuck off the coast of Maryland. The effort now to free it. That's up next. Now to Top Stories news feed, and we begin with a terrifying moment caught on camera for police officers in Wisconsin. Body camera footage shows a driver hitting multiple Oak Creek officers with his car while trying to flee. Police say the officers were trying to get the suspected drunk driver out of the car when he refused and took off. The driver was found later in Milwaukee, is now facing several charges. A massive container ship became stuck in the Chesapeake Bay. Several tugboats from Baltimore called to assist the ship named Ever Forward after it ran aground off the coast of Gibson Island, Maryland. So far, no reports of damage or injuries. Officials say there is no threat to marine life right now. Evergreen, the company that operates that vessel, is also responsible, by the way, for the massive ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal a year ago. And Saturday Night Live's Pete Davidson is heading to space. The 28-year-old comedian will be part of the fourth human space flight by Jeff Bezos' Blue Origin. Passengers on that flight experience about four minutes of weightlessness by traveling to the edge of space at an altitude of more than 65 miles. Liftoff is set for March 23rd. Can't wait for the jokes that Pete Davidson will have after that. Turning now to money talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. Gas prices keep climbing, already up 30 cents from last week. If you're wondering if there's an end in sight, you're not alone. Some in the Biden administration now saying we can expect the prices of not just gas, but other goods, too, to remain, quote, uncomfortably high. NBC Zinkley SMOA digs into what's happening. Tonight, the price of gas and goods is soaring, now leading to alleged gas theft. On Monday, a Texas gas station owner, Jerry Thale, says one driver allegedly stole $6,000 worth of diesel fuel using a trap door. Three consecutive days, it was about 350 gallons uh, of diesel. During the fourth attempt, I was actually in the office when he uh, when he decided to show up. And um, as soon as as soon as I saw him drive over the tanks, I sprinted out of the office. The driver sped off, but around the country, similar alleged gas theft incidents are taking place, with some blaming high fuel prices. Gasoline in the U.S. is up nearly 30 cents from a week ago and up nearly $1.47 since last year, with diesel fuel up over $2 since 2021. While inflation was already at 40-year highs, many experts say Russia's invasion of Ukraine means it's likely to persist. We're likely to see another year in which 12-month inflation numbers remain very uncomfortably high. In February, the U.S. placed aggressive sanctions on Russia. And I'm taking robust action to make sure the pain of our sanctions is targeted at Russian economy and that we use every tool at our disposal to protect American businesses and consumers. But weeks later, the administration acknowledged... It's not realistic to think that we can take actions of this magnitude without feeling some consequences ourselves. And it's not just gas. You almost can't afford to do anything now. Uh -huh. um, and 
I just wish it would go down. According to experts, the cost of wheat and metal is also up. In London on Thursday, nickel prices soared so high that CEO of the London Metal Exchange suspended nickel trading. It would have been extremely difficult for uh, some of our market participants to continue their activity. The price rose so much that the metal in a nickel actually became more costly than a dime. Amid the war, U.S. officials and economists say Americans should brace for ongoing inflation. While many, like gas station owner Thahil, hope U.S. leadership can pump the brakes on these rising prices soon to curb the theft and desperation. We have bills to pay. We got employees that count us that uh, need that money. Zinclair Samoa, NBC News. Zinclair, thank you so much for that report. We go to Florida now, where mid-March means, of course, spring break. But as young people flock to warm climates to party, some are taking a big risk, buying drugs that maybe they don't know exactly what is in them. The DEA has warned many pills and powders now contain fentanyl with a potency many times stronger than heroin. The results can be devastating. Katie Beck has that story. Tonight, spring breakers in Florida living it up like it's 2019. We out here. We just had come out here for a good time. Florida airports seeing a surge of visitors as COVID cases continue to decline across the country. A new study by travel insurance provider Alliance Partners found that spring break bookings shot up by 134 percent over last year's COVID depressed figures. And nationwide, nearly 2 million people are passing through TSA checkpoints daily, significantly up from the last two years at this time. But despite the low COVID infection rates, here in the U.S., experts say crowded airports still carry risks. In an airport, you never know where people are coming from. Uh, they may be from areas with higher case rates. The TSA extending mask mandates on planes until Easter weekend, but COVID isn't the only threat. We have new information tonight about an arrest in the case of a group of West Point cadets who overdosed this week on fentanyl-laced drugs. Over the weekend, officials arrested 21-year-old Axel Cassius, the suspect now linked to selling fentanyl-laced cocaine to six people found overdosing on the drug, including five unidentified West Point cadets. Cassius was charged with trafficking in cocaine. NBC was unable to reach him for comment. The U.S. Military Academy in West Point, New York, said it was aware of the situation and declined further comment, citing an ongoing investigation. And on Sunday night, the Broward Sheriff's Office says another four men were hospitalized from fentanyl use. It's unclear if they were spring breakers. Our guys are always prepared for medical calls. Alabama officials along the Gulf Coast now bracing for the worst after the overdoses in Florida. Police officers and the fire department carrying Narcan wherever they go. You can't just say, oh man, it'll never happen here because you never know what can happen day to day. We want them to enjoy themselves and then at the end of the week, we want them to go back home or go back to school safe and sound. Safe and sound and hopefully a return to some pre-pandemic fun in the sun. Katie Beck, NBC News. Katie, thank you. As crowds return to spring break, the threat of another COVID variant and another wave still looms out there. Drug makers are already bracing for that possibility. The CEO of Pfizer now saying a fourth dose of its vaccine will be needed as its effectiveness at stopping new infections wanes over time. NBC News medical contributor, CEO of Advancing Health Equity, Dr. Uche Blackstock, joins me now to try to break this down. Dr. Blackstock, why exactly is Pfizer saying now that a fourth dose will probably be needed? And when would those shots likely go into arms? Thank you so much for having me. Um, the reason why is because even after the third dose, we are seeing waning immunity against infection within just a few months, within about four to five months. However, with three doses, we are still seeing the vaccines are still effective against the most severe outcomes of COVID-19 uh, being hospitalizations and deaths. But the problem is and we're seeing with new variants is that they are breaking through uh, the vaccine infectiveness and they are causing increased infections. And so we wanna make sure that if we do have another dose that we need to give to people, that they were able to protect you know, Americans and everyone else against uh, not only uh, severe outcomes, but also infections as well. So that's why the fourth dose um, is indicated. Right. Pfizer also talking about developing a shot that would be effective against all variants of COVID. I actually asked the CDC director about that a couple of weeks ago, and she said we're not quite there yet. How, how likely do you think that is? 
You know, that's correct. I mean, that's probably going to, that's like about a year in the making um, to have a vaccine that, we, you know, they're calling it a pan coronavirus vaccine. It's going to require a considerable amount of research, clinical trials, and it's not something that's right around the corner. So it's not something that would prepare us for a next wave, next surge or variant within a few months. Dr. Blackstock, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. As the U.S. prepares for potential waves of COVID in the future, China is already in the midst of its worst surge since the initial outbreak in Wuhan. 10,000 cases reported since the beginning of March and more than 50 million people now on lockdown in China as part of the country's zero tolerance approach to COVID. A major iPhone assembly plant now forced to shut down too. Joining us now from Beijing for more on this, NBC News foreign correspondent Janice Mackey Freyer. Janice, nice to see you. Uh, it, it seems like so much of the world is starting to put COVID in the rearview mirror, or at least hoping to do that. But China is enacting its strictest lockdown measures we've seen yet. Tell us why that's happening after Omicron and the waves that we've seen over here. What's happening there? Well, Kate, it's the pace at which the, the surge is happening here that's worrying officials. The case numbers have been doubling pretty much every day for the past week. China's approach is to isolate every positive case and then quarantine anyone who's come into contact with them. So with this surge, officials are naturally worried that the healthcare system is going to be overrun fairly soon. And as well, there are fewer ICU beds per capita here compared to most countries. You look at Hong Kong and what's happening there. There are so many cases uh, and things are so out of control. They had to build a bridge from the mainland in order to rush in extra for COVID workers. Uh, here, we're seeing signs of the testing system come under strain. Officials are only now introducing rapid tests for home use, but there's still no clear idea of how those tests can be purchased and then have the data reflected in the QR system and contact tracing um, that has defined the zero COVID policy here. Uh, so officials are going, uh, taking the things from the toolbox, what they know, they're targeting mobility, they're urging people to stay put. And in a lot of cases, they're just not giving people the choice. And Janice, just to be clear, this is Omicron or a form of Omicron or some new variant? This is what they're calling Omicron, uh, stealth Omicron. It's the BA2 variant. Uh, the first wave of Omicron was the BA1. Gotcha. Uh, so it's uh, highly infectious, and it, what's, it seems to be what's driving this rapid increase in the cases here. And then you combine that, Kate, with the zero COVID policy here and how China handles every individual case. We all saw examples of it during the Olympics with the COVID bubble that kept people People sealed in, and that's why they're concerned. Is just that the the system is going to be overwhelmed. And these lockdowns that you mentioned, they've they've led to several major production hubs shutting down temporarily. How long before that might halt, uh, and that might actually affect China's economy? And could it impact prices here in the U.S.? Well, there's two key spots that are causing concern. Shenzhen, where there's a partial lockdown now, 17 and a half million people affected. It's a high tech hub. You have Foxconn, which is a major supplier to Apple, uh, being forced to idle two production lines. Shenzhen also has the fourth largest port in the world. Uh, it handles a lot of the trade with the U.S. 90 percent of Chinese electronics go through that port. And with the supply chain problems that we've all experienced over the past year, we know it doesn't take take long for delays or backlogs at ports here to cause problems down the line with reduced capacity and higher shipping rates. That is the concern as well in Shanghai. Right now, uh, they have travel restrictions in place in the city. The schools have been closed and flights have been diverted. The port for now seems to be okay, but that's the concern too, is that delays at the port in Shanghai could cause problems or chaos, as one company said, for the global supply chain. Janice Mackey Freyer with us from Beijing. Janice, thank you so much for the information. Uh, let's turn to Top Stories Global Watch now. And the missile strike hitting near a U.S. consulate in Iraq, at least a dozen missiles hitting Erbil in Iraq's Kurdish region. Iran's Revolutionary Guard has claimed responsibility for that, saying it was sending a warning to the U.S. and Israel. No U.S. facilities were damaged and no one was seriously injured. Chile has sworn in a new president, marking a major shift in the country's politics. 
36-year-old leftist and former protest leader Gabriel Boric is the youngest, the country's youngest ever elected leader. He has pledged to improve the economy, tackle progressive issues such as climate change and indig indigenous rights. He also has a female majority cabinet. President Biden expressed his support for Boric after his runoff election victory in December. For more analysis on Brady's surprising retirement, we want to bring in Tom Curran, the NFL and New England Patriots insider for NBC Sports Boston. Tom, I have whiplash. <laughs> what is going on? There's been so much speculation about why he comes out of retirement after 40 days. What do you think happened? What made him change his mind? Really, I think it was the knowledge that he still had so much more left in the tank and so much more to his own mind left to prove. I think that Tom Brady has always operated best with a chip on his shoulder and the belief that, look, I'm still good at it. He had a borderline MVP season last year. And as he sat and ruminated on watching the game and not being a part of it and still understanding that he was better than almost every other quarterback in the league, he said, what exactly did I step aside for? Yeah, so... Now that I have to ask, though, is this a risk, right? The Tampa Bay Buccaneers have roster concerns at the moment, I am told by people who are smarter than me mm -hmm. about sports. Um, is this a risk for him to go back to Tampa? Yeah, I think that when you look at the legacy and there's a notion that, well, Tom Brady gave people whiplash and he pulled a hamlet over the last 40 days and he was out, he was in, and now he's back in again. Does he diminish his legacy? Does he run the risk of not performing well? Does he run the risk of injury at the age of 45? To me, I, I just honestly looking at it objectively, I don't think it does. He's got such a track record. He's already so far exceeded what anybody could ever expect from a quarterback in the NFL to play to this age that I don't think it diminishes his legacy. Is Tampa Bay now on the cusp of a championship? No. But they're certainly in the conversation, top five or six teams in the NFL with him there. But last season, he got the storybook ending, right? We talked about it here on the show. He, he wasn't getting Lombardi yeah. trophy, but, but why do this? Why come back for one more? I think it's the same thing. I mean, it's, it's an individual, I think, um, preference on his part. Look, if, if you could still do the news and do it at a high level, and you wanted to keep doing it and you stepped aside for some reason that wasn't related to you and you said, man, I still like doing it though. Are you guys okay if I go back to work? Well then you'd be happy to go back to work if everyone signed off on it. And I think Brady is in that same position. He knows he can still do it at a high level and he knows that he can still chase that ring. Basically it's going back for that one more round when everybody says, you know what? Let's just have one more round. Tom, do we know why he stepped off the field to begin with? Like, why did he announce his retirement? I remember at the time he was saying his family wanted that. Why do you yeah. think that? Why do you think we've gone back and forth here? I think that's really the crux of the issue. Was he trying to extract something from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in stepping aside, whether it be a relationship with head coach Bruce Arians, whether it be any kinds of guarantees as to what Tampa Bay would do in this free agency period, which begins on Wednesday, players they would acquire. Um, to me, I think some of it, folks I spoke to close to Brady, said that giving an answer as to where he was leaning 40 days ago at least removed the spotlight from him and the scrutiny as to what is your answer about whether or not you're coming back. He certainly fed the flames and fanned the flames in the last 40 days as to whether or not he would be coming back and changing his mind. But at least they had an answer instead of dragging it out and saying, what's it going to be, Tom? What's it going to be, Tom? Tom Curran, always good to have you with us. Appreciate it. For Tom Yamas, I'm Kate Snow in New York. Stay right there. More news now on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.